Good afternoon and welcome to session two of Inviting Biodiversity into our Gardens and Beyond. Today we'll be exploring our fragile forest ecosystems with authors Donald Davis and Joan Maloof. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the, land, the Land Conservancy is Ohio's largest land trust and to date has protected more than 70,000 acres of natural lands, family farms, and urban green spaces. At the Land Conservancy, I plan nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages. Our goal is to provide a platform to learn and develop a greater appreciation for our natural world. I am pleased to continue this collaboration with the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium and Nature Spark to bring you this series. Through our collaboration, we hope to have an impact in transforming your gardens and green spaces into functioning diverse habitats. My co-hosts, Anne Cicerella and Judy Sumrock, are passionate about this topic. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium. She works to build connections and inspire conversations about the importance of restoring our fragmented native habitats, starting with our own backyards and community gardens. Judy possesses a wealth of knowledge about our natural world through her company, Nature Spark. She works with children and adults in the realm of nature education and exploration. Judy loves to share her nature knowledge through field trips and public programs, both virtually and in person. I thank them for both sponsoring and planning this series with me. I enjoy moderating the symposium each year and we hope you will stay engaged and join us over the coming weeks as we are offering additional sessions to help us garden with a purpose. Our next session is on March 14th. Our talks will be related to na native plant connections. We'll welcome Angela Morehouse, the author of Flower Bugs, a guide to flower associated true bugs of the Midwest, and Trevor Smith for his program, Native Plants, Your Backyard and Climate Change. I'll drop a link to registration for that session in the chat today. Now I'd like to take a moment and recognize and thank our sponsors who have made it possible for us to offer this symposium for free. Thank you to the Ohio Division of Wildlife, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, Avonlea Gardens, Biodiversity and Landscape Design, the Cuyahoga Soil Water Conservation District, Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership, Leaves for Wildlife, Meadow City Nursery, Natives in Harmony, and Ohio Prairie Nursery. Both our presenters today have recently published books, which are available for purchase online from Loganberry Books. I'll drop a link to our Loganberry Books Symposium Bookshop in the chat so you can easily find these titles. And remember, please do use the Q&A feature to post your questions. We'll pause for a few questions if time permits following each presentation. Now on to our show. It's my pleasure to introduce Donald Davis. Donald has authored several books, including the 2021 book, The American Chestnut and Environmental History, which is the title of his program today. Welcome, Donald. Great to be here. Thanks. Looks good. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Renee. I really want to thank you and Anne and everyone at the uh, Western Reserve Land Conservancy for having me on today. Uh, this is a topic I care a lot about, and uh, I um, will probably continue to work on this topic um, in the future as well. Um, I currently work for the Harvard Forest as a part-time research scholar on a um, National Science Foundation uh, grant, which is uh, going to expire eventually, but I continue to work with them. And uh, I'm also involved in several other projects. I have a PowerPoint presentation for you, for you guys today, and I wanna try to go through some images pretty quickly in the beginning, because I wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about today comes from my book, The American Chestnut, although you're gonna find quite a bit of new material as well. First thing we wanna do is sort of uh, make sure that we're all on the same page regarding what the American Chestnut tree is and what it is not. Uh, so let's do a quick sort of a, a ID uh, exercise. Uh, the American Chestnut leaf is long and narrow. 
It's very supple, pliable. It's a very papery, which is very much um, different than Chinese chestnut leaves, which are much thicker uh, and um, not as pliable. Uh, this is a young chestnut stem, so it's still greenish, but eventually the stem that you see here will turn a purplish, kind of a deep red or purplish color. And that's one way to identify the American chestnut. When you look at the American chestnut leaves as compared to other uh, non-native chestnuts, you see also quite a bit of difference. Uh, these leaves are pressed, so they don't look quite like they would in the, in the field. But the leaf on the left is the American chestnut, and then you have the Chinese chestnut, then you have the European chestnut, and there on the far right, far right hand side, you have the Japanese chestnut. Um, images on the left or the top side of the leaf, images on the right or the bottom side. You can say that American chestnut leaves on the bottom side are pretty much hairless, have very few hairs. When you look at other species, though, you sometimes find that people get them confused. The Ozark chinkapin can sometimes uh, look like the American chestnut. The leaf in the middle, in fact, may actually be a hybrid, sometimes referred to as Castania neglecta, which is a hybrid between the American chestnut and the Ozark chinkapin. And of course, Allegheny chinkapins are quite uh, prevalent in the eastern U.S. Uh, their leaf is also small and um, not as um, uh, large as the American chestnut leaf. In the fall, um, the American chestnut made entire hillsides a beautiful brassy color, uh, very much similar to the way hickory trees do today. You don't see this too often. There's not that many chestnut trees out there that uh, you can see in the fall, but uh, here's a, a great photograph to show you just how colorful the leaves were. And of course, the blossoms of the American chestnut uh, were um, uh, sort of famous um, in the springtime, late spring, early summer. They, inter they turned entire hillsides completely white as if snow was falling on the mountaintops. In fact, there's probably a dozen different mountains, White Top Mountain, Yellow Top Mountain, for example, that were named after the chestnut blossoming. The nuts. Uh, of the various chestnut trees uh, are also very different. The Ozark chinkapin, uh, one nut to a burr, very roundish sort of nut. The uh, Chinese chestnut, uh, much larger. And of course, the American chestnut in the middle there is about what I call nickel size, about the size of a nickel. And you also see differences uh, whenever the nut appears either on the left side or the right side or the center of the burr. So. If the nut appeared in the center of the burr, it would be flat on both sides. But if it was on the left, it would be flat on one side and on the right, flat on one side as well. Here's another view of the various um, nuts from the various uh, chestnut species. Again, you see on the left, the American chestnut quite small. And then the European chestnut, this is what you find often in the grocery stores in the fall when you're buying chestnuts to roast uh, for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Uh, Chinese chestnut, you also find those in the stores as well. And then, of course, the largest of all the nuts is the Japanese chestnut. And the Japanese chestnut tree was the one that uh, was imported in the late 1800s and brought the infamous chestnut blight with it. And sort of the rest is history. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. The bark of the chestnut uh, was very gray, um, very furrowed. Uh, from a distance, it might appear more brownish, um, even pinkish at times, uh, but a very distinct bark. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how both Native Americans and um, uh, contemporary folks uh, use the bark of the American chestnut tree. Range of the American chestnut. This is another very important question that I addressed in my book that uh, uh, some individuals are not aware of. Of course, this is the standard range map of the American chestnut. Um, this was uh, produced in, in the late 70s by Albert Little in the Atlas of the United States Trees. A lot of different organizations use this map. It uh, basically shows the trees pretty much prevalent until you get towards the fall line. And then as you get towards the fall line, they become very sporadic. 
So this is very different than the map I generated in my book, which shows the range of the chestnut going all the way down to the fall line, and sometimes even past the fall line. And I discussed the reason for this in my book. This is due to a, a disease known as uh, ink disease, um, Autothera, that was brought to the United States in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and uh, wiped out probably nearly a fourth of the range of the American chestnut. If you were to go back during the last ice age, you would actually see the range of the chestnut uh, all the way down to the um, Atlantic coast in the Gulf of Mexico. You had a very narrow band of American chestnuts uh, 20,000 years ago. And these trees, some of these trees actually lived what today is uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico because during the last ice age, the um, uh, the state of Florida was like twice its size, and therefore a lot of this uh, territory here was actually wooded. And that's where you found the American chestnut 20,000 years ago. So how did the chestnut tree get northward? Well, it's because of these guys. Uh, the passenger pigeon uh, brought chestnuts northward. Uh, blue jays, a uh, great mover of chestnuts. Um, blue jays can scatter hoard literally thousands of nuts in a single season. They often take them several miles from where the, the nuts fall, and they often plant them in uh, open areas, uh, so which is uh, great for uh, chestnut sprouting and growth. And the American crow, common crow, also moved chestnuts as well. Of course, there were other chestnut movers, uh, squirrels, of course, mice, uh, and even chipmunks uh, were movers of chestnuts. And the Allegheny wood rat uh, also was a mover of chestnuts, although they cache most of their nuts inside uh, cavernous sort of areas. We also uh, can talk about something called the chestnut belt. This was an area where the American chestnut tree dominated uh, the forest. Uh, outside the chestnut belt, you seldom found the trees uh, comprising more than 10% of the canopy. But within the chestnut belt, you might have trees dominating 30, 40, even 50% uh, of the canopy. So um, as late as 1900, people were using this expression to talk about the many chestnut trees uh, in this particular part of the United States. Of course, if you go back 20,000 years, 15,000 years, 10,000 years, you're going to find interactions between Native Americans and chestnuts. Um, Native American groups celebrated the trees in folklore and mythology. They were obviously an important source of nutrition. They provided habitat and mass for game animals. They provided the raw materials for canoes. Um, one um, Native American myth even uh, depicted chestnuts as the very first living thing brought forth by the creator. And of course, among the Chickasaw and Nanchez, you find that the lunar calendar was based on the harvesting of chestnuts or the gathering of chestnuts or the eating of chestnuts uh, in certain months of the year. This image, by the way, is um, was done by a famous mur muralist uh, who painted this scene um, from approximately, it depicts a scene, individuals harvesting nut mast about 8,000 years ago. Uh, the Iroquois um, also have many myths and folklore traditions associated with the chestnut, but they also did something else. They actually forbid the burning of chestnut wood during their official assemblies. And the reason for this is that American chestnut wood really sparks a lot. Uh, it, it actually caused a lot of fires in open fireplaces during the colonial period. Because of that, the Iroquois Confederacy in their actual constitution said that when the lords are assembled, the council fire shall be kindled, but not with chestnut wood. So you couldn't use any chestnut wood when you had uh, Iroquois assemblies. Among the um, Cherokees, you have also a considerable, a considerable amount of folklore uh, surrounding uh, the American chestnut. There's a beautiful story um, from the uh, shaman, the shaman swimmer, known as Swimmer, who you see there on the right, who uh, uh, it was called the Bear Man. It was about an individual who was trying to kill a black bear. The black bear tells him that he has magical powers and that 
there's no reason for you to shoot me because you can't kill me. So why don't you just come to my house and live together? Uh, the hunter agrees and there a, a, a bear council is formed and uh, they start talking about the problem of food scarcity. That is chestnut scarcity, scarcity. And eventually two bears announced to the group that they found a place where there's so many chestnuts and acorns that the mass was knee deep. Um, and at that point, the bear provides the man with two pawfuls of, of chestnuts. And, and the man uh, at that point decides to hibernate with the bear all winter. Uh, there's much more, much more, more to this story. And I tell the full story uh, in my book. Uh, Cherokees were also makers of chestnut bread. It was sort of a dumpling. They put it inside uh, corn leaves, corn husk, and boiled it in water uh, for half an hour, hour or so to make kind of what you might call a, a chestnut dumpling. Uh, of course, Cherokees also ate the, um, the nuts raw, uh, and they also burned the, uh, the woods uh, underneath chestnut trees in the fall, which is very unusual because those would have been fairly hot fires. But they burned the duff around the leaves, which uh, not only helped in gathering the chestnuts, but also uh, killed the harmful weevils that damaged the nuts. So, so that allowed the, the nuts to be preserved for a much longer period. Uh, the bark of the, the trees was also used not only by the Cherokees, but by several Native American groups. Uh, William Bartram, actually, in his uh, travels, uh, uh, talked about a cabin that he saw that was... Uh, um, um, covered uh, with chestnut bark. Um, I'll talk a, a little bit more about this later, but this bark is actually on a, a, a 19th century home in Western North Carolina. But you can see the effect. Uh, the, the, the bark was pressed, it was dried, and then it could be laid on inside or outside uh, a Cherokee cabin to form uh, a type of siding. Chestnut culture, um, this is a topic that folks like to talk about. If we had more time, we could talk a lot about the ways in which chestnut trees and nuts were used in American culture. Uh, I found evidence that chestnuts were being shipped from New England to Charleston, South Carolina, um, just uh, after the um, uh, American Revolution. Uh, you first, though, start seeing chestnuts wanted uh, advertisements in newspapers in the um, early 1800s. Um, this is where stores all up and down the eastern seaboard were advertising chestnuts for sale or chestnuts wanted. Uh, people could uh, trade their chestnuts, you know, in for cash or use them to barter for other items at the various stores. And of course, on the left, you have the infamous uh, chestnut roaster. Uh, there were literally hundreds of these guys on street corners in Manhattan uh, during the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, this uh, particular uh, chestnut roaster is uh, selling chestnuts in, in Baltimore, Maryland. This was taken in 1905. When I do public presentations in front of a live audience, I often uh, quote this um, passage from my book. So I, I'll go ahead and do it for you guys as well. Uh, this is uh, found on page three of my book, and it's, uh, it's, it's great to start I talk about the American chestnut with this quote because it, it tells you just how important the tree was to American culture. So the quote's from 1915, and the person who said this was the New England forester, Philip Buttrick. So he said that the American chestnut possessed a greater variety of uses than almost any other American hardwood. As it touched, he said, upon almost every phase of our existence, so to bolster his argument, Buttrick, Buttrick says this. He says the tree serves as a shade and ornamental tree in our parks and estates. Its wood is used in the building, in the, in the building, building, and construction of houses and manufacture of our furniture. Uh, we sit down in chairs made of chestnut and transact our business uh, at desk of chestnut veneered with oak. We receive messages from the distance over wires strung on chestnut. Um, post and in a railroad train and read no newspapers into whose composition chestnut pulp has gone while our trains travel on rails um, supported on chestnut ties and over trestles built of chestnut pilings along a track whose right of way is fenced by wires supported on chestnut post. 
And on the same train travels goods shipped in boxes and barrels made of chestnut boards and staves. Even the leather in our shoes is an extract made from chestnut wood. So at last, when the tree can no longer serve us in any other way, it even forms the basis for uh, to make our coffins. So you can really see that uh, the chestnut was really vital to the material culture of people living in the United States in the 18 and 1900s. Um, and in fact, by the late 1800s, almost all of our built environment, including the interiors of factories, train depots, and dwellings, were using some sort of chestnut wood. Chestnut was used to make pianos, uh, baby cradles, broom handles, dowel rods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the nuts, which were everywhere, were celebrated in poetry and songs uh, and popular literature and even changed the, the way that we spoke. Um, um, all of these things gave the tree really a unique status uh, among all trees and, and making it important to American material culture as it was to North American forest ecology. This image is uh, an image taken in Linville, North Carolina in 18, uh, it's a structure built in 1891, the, the Eceola Lodge there. There's a dozen or so buildings that have their siding, just like with the Cherokee uh, cabins were, sided with chestnut. Um, I've got another image I think to share with you later, but uh, this this uh, chestnut siding is more than a century old and it's still, still around. It's a really an amazing, uh, way to uh, use chestnut in uh, construction. Of course, we can't talk about the American chestnut without talking about chestnut decline and the loss of the American chestnut due to the chestnut blight fungus. Um, this is, a, of course, a, a, a horrible tragedy that happened. Um, as, I, as I demonstrated in my book, the uh, fungus was probably first brought to the United States on Japanese chestnuts sometime in the late 1800s. Took a while though for it to spread and eventually found its way into the New York Zoological Park or what today we refer to often as the Bronx Zoo. Uh, individual by, by the name of Hermann Merkel was surveying the grounds in the summer of 1904 and he found uh, several blight injured chestnut trees. He simply sprayed them with a fungicide and went on about his business. Then the following year, the following uh, spring, he saw more trees uh, had perished. So he asked William Murrell of the New York Botanical Garden, which is just next door, to inspect the dead and dying trees and to offer his opinion. Murrell, who was also a noted mycologist, uh, he couldn't identify the disease, but recommended spraying all the infected trees. It was some 438 of them with a, a fungicide that they used to call um, Bordeaux mixture, a Bordeaux mixture. So all the trees were sprayed. And of course, by 1906, it was it was apparent that the, the spraying of the trees was gonna have no effect and that the trees were gonna continue to perish and that the fungus was gonna continue uh, to spread um, outside of New York. And it wasn't until 1906 that Mural names the fungus um, Diaportha parasitica, um, and then later in 1978, we actually um, have the name that we use today for the fungus, uh, which is Cryphonectra, Cryphonectria parasitica. So that's uh, the, how the fungus is referred to today. Here's a very cool map from 1911, which shows the, the distribution of the dead and dying trees. So you can see very early on that the, 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 the blight had spread uh, far and wide. Uh, those individual dots though, really uh, represent single isolated infections. Uh, but notice that as early as 1911, you were seeing the blight spraying, uh, spreading all the way down to into West Virginia and, uh, and parts of uh, Southern uh, Virginia. Uh, I noted in my book that this this kind of pattern that you see there oddly looks like sort of a, a, a hurricane that came ashore. And what's interesting is just a few months before the blight was discovered, there were several hurricanes that hit almost exactly where the epicenter that you see of, of the fungus spread is. So I, I, I talk about the possibility that the hurricane was responsible for spreading the blight more rapidly across the United States. 
of course, this is what it looked like in places where you had lots of chestnut trees, such as the uh, Skyline Parkway or the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, this image is quite remarkable in that in the distance, you can see an entire hillside uh, of chestnut trees, which are also uh, dead and dying. So the blight spreads fairly rapidly, but it really wasn't until 1950 that you could say almost every tree in the former range of the American chestnut um, had signs signs of the blight. Of course, um, although I know a lot of you guys are joining us today outside of Ohio, I thought uh, that it would be important to talk a little bit about the environmental history of the American chestnut in Ohio. Um, I had uh, I did a little bit of additional research before uh, before creating the presentation, and I discovered that uh, Ohio. Um, has one of the largest surviving uh, American chestnut trees in the United States today. It's in, in the northern part of the state. It's fairly large, as you can see there. And there has been some newspaper stories written about this tree as late as 2017, but I haven't seen anything recently about the tree. So I'm hoping that during the so q and I, yes. I did some I did some investigating on the tree with oh, our wow. um, chief botanist here in the state of Ohio. His name's Rick Gardner, and he told me that the tree is still there, um, but it is showing um, some decline. Oh, okay, so great. So Thank you for folks updating. can still go see it. Yes. <laughs> so what's interesting about Ohio is that chestnut densities probably never rose above five percent across the eastern portion, southern portion of the state, where you found most of the chestnut trees. However, it was the six most common species, ranking ahead of pines, tulip trees, chestnut oak, red oak, and other unnamed tree species. Uh, if you go back to the late 1700s, uh, in, for example, the Morgan Township of Gallia County, um, you would find uh, chestnut trees, but they would be primarily as John Matthews recorded, primarily on the tops of ridges, which is really not unusual because the tree really liked to be in places um, uh, that were, you know, seven, 800 or more feet uh, in elevation. Um, in Hawking County, in the Star Township, another uh, surveyor uh, found uh, one American chestnut tree that was uh, 18 inches in diameter. And as I point out in my book, uh, central uh, second growth chestnut was still actually in Kashtokton uh, County, uh, where two thirds of all standing forest had been converted to agriculture as late as 1870. So you could still find second growth chestnut in, um, in uh, that particular part of the state. This is a map that was done by a study that was published just as my book was going into, well, it was, it was published after the book had gone into press, um, wonderful, short article uh, by Hutchinson and Dyer, which looks at uh, the uh, presence of the American chestnut in Ohio's historic woodlands. So I'd highly recommend this article. Uh, they looked at the witness trees that were, you know, the trees that were surveyed in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and found uh, a little more than 100, or roughly about 2% of all the trees in this particular area or uh, American chestnut. So I have a sort of a concluding section, although this is gonna take a little bit of time to get through to talk about the future of the American chestnut. Uh, is there hope for the American chestnut? Well, the good news is that there's still a lot of chestnuts out there. Uh, it's not, even though we refer to the tree as being functionally extinct, there are literally millions of American chestnut sprouts and small saplings uh, in the forest today. This was a study uh, based on the U.S. forest inventory to the 2010. So it is, you know, it is now more than a decade uh, old. Uh, and my guess is there's probably fewer chestnuts now than there was then. But still, you'll notice that in some parts of the trees. Uh, 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 range, at least according to Little, uh, you still you you still find quite uh, quite a few chestnuts. Uh, notice the uh, the section there in Western North Carolina, incredible number of stems uh, still surviving in that part of the tree's former range. 
Um, even even in Ohio, you find some chestnut sprouts um, still in existence. So the the same sort of U.S. Forest Service inventory also found that there may be as 2.5 million blooming size chestnuts. That would be trees that are you know four or five, six inches six inches in diameter. Of course, as many of you know in the audience today, that often what happens is the chestnuts will you know, grow to four or five inches in diameter there, they'll blossom, they'll produce a few nuts, and then they'll die, they'll catch the blight, and then they'll die the following year. Um, so that's why we tend to refer to these trees as being functionally extinct, although um, this is, you know, with each passing year becoming more and more difficult to, st to, to say with 100% certainty. And that's because uh, in states like Maine, we're finding more and more trees growing to adult size and uh, reproducing. Uh, this is a wonderful specimen um, that, that's found in Lovell, Maine. It's uh, more than two feet in diameter. It's 114 feet in height. Uh, I'm assuming if it's still alive, it's even taller now because the trees tend to grow three, four, five feet per year. And um, as far as I know, it's still considered the largest American chestnut tree in Maine. And of course, the most famous example of surviving American chestnut trees comes to us through the naturalist that many of you probably know of, probably re have read his, I think, uh, 20 books or so. His name is Bern Heinrich, and Bern Heinrich is now retired um, from the University of Vermont, uh, Professor Emeritus there. On his uh, farm in, in southern Maine, he has uh, roughly... 1,300 chestnut trees still alive, still surviving and growing in his woodlot. Uh, he planted some trees originally, I believe there were five in the spring of 1982, and two of those five trees are still alive. And of course, um, he's done a wonderful sort of study of showing how the blue jays uh, spread the surviving uh, nuts and saplings all over his property. So um, his his case his sort of you know case study shows you that it is possible for the trees to survive the blight and continue surviving. Uh, these two trees, by the way, have the honey fungus disease, which could kill them. Uh, they don't have the blight; they have something else that could uh, cause them to die early. And of course, these two trees these are the two of the probably the two largest American chestnut trees surviving on the planet. Kind of ironically, they're not in North America. They're actually in the Tavurin Arboretum, Arboretum in uh, Tavurin, uh, Belgium, which is a little suburb of, of um, uh, a suburb uh, just outside of uh, Brussels. Uh, I went there about six years ago, seven years ago, I guess, and I, I had some professional foresters there at the Arboretum to remeasure the trees. Uh, they're both of the trees are more than 120 feet high. I think the tree on the right is about 128 feet tall. They're not quite four feet in diameter, but my guess they are today because uh, these tr trees grow pretty fast. On the negative side of the future of the American chestnut, we have this Phytophthora disease that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. This is the disease that wiped out almost a fourth of the trees. Um, Prior to the American Civil War, uh, this uh, this is what a tree looks like once it's contracted ink disease. You can see there the roots really do look like black ink. Kills the trees very quickly. Not only kills chestnut trees, but also other species. And it's made its way pretty much well above the fall line, well well into the, the range of the American chestnut. Uh, in Georgia, we've had quite a number of trees um, uh, die of uh, die of ink disease. So this is going to be a problem in terms of the future of the American chestnut. It's going to be very, very difficult to grow the trees in places where Phytophthora is very prevalent. We also have the problem of, of, of climate change and global warming. Study done, sort of a, a simulation study looking at the future sort of range of the American chestnut based, based on global warming found that the range of the chestnut probably will go northward well into Canada, uh, into Nova Scotia, and probably the trees will not be able to survive uh, any more below the fall line. Uh, so this is a, another interesting aspect 
of the future of the American chestnut. That also may explain why we're finding so many trees surviving in places like Maine, Michigan, uh, and Northern Ohio. Of course, there's several organizations working to solve the um, solve the blight problem, um, and they're doing fantastic work. Maybe some of you in the audience today uh, belong to one of these organizations. Uh, one of the organizations that that really does not get a lot of attention is uh, called the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation, or ACCF. Uh, this group was formed in 1985 in order to restore the American chestnut to, quote, its former place in our eastern hardwood forest. It was uh, founded by the late Gary Griffin. Uh, Gary passed away just a couple of years ago. He was a professor emeritus at Virginia Tech, lifelong chestnut researcher. Um, he argued that even though surviving American chestnut trees are rare, they those that do survive do possess sort of a genetic proclivity for resisting the blight. So his strategy was simple. You just take, you just intercross surviving trees in a breeding program that captures blight resistance. And then you have a line of pure American chestnuts, of trees that supposedly can repel the blight. Uh, since the founding of the group in, the, um, in 85, uh, ACCF has distributed literally tens of thousands of nuts and seedlings across the Eastern US. Um, some of their orchards actually have uh, trees that reportedly demonstrate blight resistance in about 10% of the pro progeny. Uh, so this is something to keep an eye on um, this group. And I believe they're still um, making uh, the seedlings and nuts available. Uh, so you can go to their website and, and, and look for those kinds of opportunities if you're interested in growing and planting pure American chestnut trees. Of course, the organization that most people think about when they think about American chestnut restoration is the American Chestnut Foundation. I was uh, the founding president of the Georgia chapter of the American Chestnut. I was president in 2004, 2005. Uh, I got the organization going. We got a 50, we got 501c3 status in record number in record time. And uh, that that chapter is doing great work. They still are very active and uh, have quite a few uh, orchards growing the trees. Uh, the American Chestnut Foundation is sort of infamous, famous for its back cross breeding program. Uh, and this chart sort of shows how it works. It's a pretty simple sort of concept. You basically, you know, crossbreed a, a American tree with a Chinese tree, and the offspring are 50-50. They're half Chinese, half American. You then inoculate those trees with a blight, and the trees that survive have some sort of blight resistance, and then you breed those trees back to an American, and then the end result is a tree that's far more American, um, you know, maybe as much as three-fourths American, has a little bit of Chinese uh, in it, but is somewhat blight resistant. You do this again with the next generation of offspring. So eventually you have what's called a BC3, F3 tree that is 15th, 16th American as the Chinese genes uh, that keep it from getting the blight and the trees can grow large and survive, at least in theory. A few years ago though, some a DNA analysis found that you're probably gonna need as, as many as nine genes of the Chinese trees in the you know the the, the in in the uh, hybrids, in order for the trees to fully repel the blight and survive, so that's presenting sort of a uh, problem for this particular breeding program. Of course, twenty years ago or so, uh, the American Chestnut Foundation also began looking at the work of William Powell, just recently passed away. William Powell uh, had developed a genetically modified tree um, that was called Darling 58. And um, these trees are planted all in all kinds of orchards in many different locations. Uh, they're monitor monitored by APHIS, the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Um, there's a petition uh, with APHIS now that would allow the trees to be planted in the wild. Mm -hmm if the uh, petition is approved. Um, this petition was filed by pa Powell uh, in 2020. 
um, this petition uh, would deregulate the trees so that, again, well, they would have the ability to plant them in the wild, give, donate them to the public, so on and so forth. After the petition was filed in 2020, there was an environmental impact statement that was published in draft form in 2022. Uh, and we expect a final decision any day now, any week now, uh, although some of you may be aware of this, in the last few months, the American Chestnut Foundation has withdrawn its support of the Darling 58 tree and the genetically modified trees because they found that in the field, the trees really didn't survive. They formed these awful and sort of unsightly cankers. Uh, many of the trees died. And so they believe that this is not the tree that should be involved in chestnut restoration. They haven't totally abandoned the GE approach, but they certainly have abandoned this uh, Darling 58 tree. So is there hope for the American chestnut? Uh, is there hope for Castania dentata? Well, sort of the quick answer is kind of a qualified yes. Uh, the tree performed invaluable ecosystem services it uh, also fed, housed, and employed us. So I think to fully abandon the trees and just let sort of nature take its course be, would be irresponsible. Although I think that the future return of the tree is certainly possible. In my own opinion, I think it should be done as carefully as possible and without harming the genomic heritage of this iconic tree. I also think we should keep in mind that whatever restoration path is taken, the hybrid approach, the approach of, um, of ACCF, pure American high, uh, tree approach, or even the GE approach, uh, the full return of the trees to the Eastern deciduous forest is going to take a considerable, a considerable amount of time, uh, centuries even. Uh, for example, after the Ice Age, it took 5,000 years for all those chestnut movers, the crows and pasture pigeons and jays, took 5,000 years for the trees to spread from Florida to Tennessee. So even with an army of you know tree planters, it's gonna take quite a while to return to the tree once we get a tree that is fully blight resistance. But however long it takes, I do believe that people in Ohio and neighboring states and many of you, uh, you know, watching and listening today uh, will be involved in chestnut restoration efforts. So uh, let's continue working on this problem. Let's see if we can solve it. And hopefully, uh, if not in our generation and future generations, we'll be able to enjoy uh, the benefits uh, of the American chestnut. So I'd like to end there. And that gives us, I think, a few minutes uh, for Q&A. Great. Thank you, Donald. And we do, we have some questions here. So I'll run those past you right now. Um, right. How did the flowers of the American chestnut compare to the unpleasant odor of the Chinese chestnut flowers? Pretty similar. In fact, okay. Henry, Henry David Thoreau uh, talked about them, uh, I think in the most positive way. And he even referred to the aroma as being quote heavy. So they did have kind of a musty uh, odor and people said that it was not the most sort of pleasant smell. Uh, I also came across uh, a very interesting quote. I think this was in a New England journal that said that chestnut trees, when they're blossoming, it's a perfect place to camp because the mosquitoes stay away. <laughs> so it could be that the odor of the chestnut blossom sort of kept the mosquitoes away. But, but what's fascinating is that in Europe, where you have the European chestnut, there's entire um, culture around beekeeping so that you can actually have a honey that's pure chestnut honey. And wow. it's very medicinal. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, very healthy. Um, I just bought, uh, I think, a pint at the Istanbul airport in Turkey. It was like $45, $50. Uh, so you still find in countries like Turkey, them producing uh, chestnut honey. And um, I discussed this a little bit in the book because this issue of the pollen and the pollination is very important for the future of the tree. So 
you know, if we ge genetically modify a tree and we have bees pollinate them, is this going to harm the bees or, you know, other sort of native insects that are pollinating yeah. those trees? So this is something we need to think about, I would argue. Okay. Um, so here's a question. Um, what can be done today if there is a tree with the blights? Well, if it's, you know, where you can reach it, it's always good to apply sort of a fungicide to it, spray a fungicide on it. Some of the members of the American Chestnut Foundation will often mud pack it. So you take mud and you just apply it to the to the cankers or the areas where you see the blight fungus. It often starts off with these tiny little red spores. So if you catch it early and sort of put a mud pack around those spores, mm -hmm. uh, you could, you know, prevent the spread of it. And there is some evidence that if you slow down the spread and you allow the trees to sort of develop some natural resistance, you can keep the trees alive longer. And the longer the tree survives, the more likely it can to eventually, you know, uh, overcome the attack of the blight. You know, the blight doesn't, that's why you see the, 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 the sprouts coming up from the stumps is that the blight really can't live underground. And so, you, you know, where chestnut tree has been cut down, you'll continue to see the, the coppice sprouts come up from the ground or, you know, a century after that tree uh, was perhaps originally cut. So the fungus sort of hates darkness, hates soil. Um, but once the fungus gets up in the top of a tree where you can't reach it, this was the problem in the, you know, the Bronx Zoo is that mm -hmm. the fungus is 50, 60, 70 feet in the air. And there's not a whole lot you can do at this point. And if you do apply a fungicide, then the next rain that comes is going to sort of wash away the fungicide. Uh, okay. In my book, I talk about these fascinating experiments that people were doing in the teens and 20s where they were literally injecting all kinds of chemicals into the trees, literally, you know, dripping chemicals into the trees to see if they could uh, repel the blight. Right, sure. Um, if someone wants to plant American chestnuts, what would you recommend and what would you discourage doing? Well, first thing I would do is make sure that the area in which you live is, is in part of the, you know, original chestnut range. Okay. And then once you've established that, you want to make sure that your uh, land, your soil has no Phytophthora uh, because Phytophthora will kill the trees in just a very short period. So you okay. have to make sure you, you can get your county agent to test your soil for Phytophthora, or you could just plant a tree you know, plant a pure American chestnut and see if it dies of phytophthora. It's very easy to identify. You pull the tree up and if the roots are black, then it, it has phytophthora and ink disease. Um, okay. And then, you know, just, uh, um, you know, the American Chestnut Foundation, other groups have some very good little brochures and pamphlets about, you know, how to grow the trees. They grow very fast. So in good conditions, they can so grow six, seven is... feet a year. That is a question, Donald. Where do you recommend folks go and get trees from if they're looking for seedlings? Any recommendations? Yeah, I would say um, the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation, a uh, good source. Okay. Uh, the American Chestnut Foundation, also a good source. Okay. Um, you know, almost every state has a chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. So you can, you know, go to your chapter and, and request uh, pure American chestnuts. And if you live in an area um, where there are lots of, you know, trees sprouting and stump sprouts, you can, you know, go into the woods and see if you can find one that way. But um, it just depends on where you live. Okay. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Have you seen the wonderful American chestnut trees planted by Morton Sterling at his mansion in Nebraska City, Nebraska, at the Arbor Day Foundation. No, I have not. I would love okay. to see those. I would love okay. to see those. Apparently, they are old and large. So um, wonderful. Oh, I have Chinese chestnut trees on my property. Should I remove them? Oh, well, I wouldn't think so. Um, um, it's interesting, when I was chapter president of the American Chestnut Foundation, once a week I was getting a telephone call. Someone says, I have an American chestnut, and I would go out to their home, and it was always a Chinese chestnut. So Chinese chestnuts are everywhere. The American government promoted their planning in the in the 1930s, so they're very common. 
especially as you know trees found in in people's yards um uh, you know they're they produce uh, food for wildlife you know i would say that they're they're um probably more beneficial than harmful even though they're not native right i agree i would i would say if you're interested in growing you know pure american chestnuts and you want pure american chestnuts and you have a chinese chestnut tree i would probably cut it down but but uh but you, I, could, I, or you could experiment with, you know, like with the American chestnut, you can experiment with the hybrid approach and, you know, it'd be kind of a fun experiment. Um, well, well, Donald, this is something you and I chatted about when we were talking before the program today. Can you talk a little bit about horse chestnuts um, and are they the same, similar to American chestnut? And um, also they're curious about chinkapin oaks. So yeah, so the that. horse chestnuts, you know, they're not in the Castania family of trees. Uh, horse chestnuts, you know, the, in Ohio, you have the Ohio Buckeye, which is a type of uh, chestnut, horse chestnut. Uh, um, I think, I, as I mentioned to Re Renee the other day, the, the famous poem by Longfellow under the spreading chestnut tree is actually about a horse chestnut and not about American chestnut. And I did quite a bit of research because I wanted to find that tree. And I discovered that the tree died probably a century or so ago. And they made actually a chair from that tree, which I believe can still be seen in one of the Longfellow museums, um, you know, in the area where he lived, if I'm not mistaken. So they definitely confirmed that that tree was a horse chestnut tree and not an American chestnut tree. And this <laughs> does present some problems even for me because when I was trying to document all the place names in America where you, you know, you have you know, mountains named chestnut and streets named chestnut. In some instances, those trees were probably horse chestnuts and not American chestnuts. So you have to sort of factor that in because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the horse chestnut was used by native Americans to kill fish. They would put them in the water and it would uh, take the oxygen out of the water and it would stun the fish, wouldn't harm the fish. I mean, it would it would stun them. They couldn't breathe, so they would come floating to the top, and they would gather the fish. Uh, so there were certain unique uses. Of course, horse chestnuts are often kept by kids, you know, for good luck, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's an interesting tree, and certainly in the springtime, beautiful blossoms. Um, you know, in in so. Ukraine today, in Kiev, the the tree, the main street, Krashatik, and the main the main street in downtown. Uh, Kiev, Kiev is um, is lined with chestnut trees. Wow, and they're beautiful in the springtime. But horse beautiful. chestnuts, that is. Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, so this is this is a funny question, and and I agree with you, Alex. Do birds really spread the chestnuts? The chestnuts seem way too big to fit in their beaks. Well, again, the chestnut, the American chestnut, was that like nickel size. Uh -huh. And um, when you look at the scatterhorn activity of jays, for example, the jays can swallow, their esophagus expands. So they can swallow as many as like five uh, um, acorns. You know, it's been proven. So if they can swallow an acorn, they can certainly swallow an American chestnut. Passenger pigeon also, they did some studies that it's possible that the, that, uh, the passenger pigeon, again, because of its crawl, it would expand and they could swallow as many as 10 American chestnuts. In my book, I quote a, a, a very funny little story about a man in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park who shot a wild turkey. And I believe there was 20 something American chestnuts in the craw of the wild turkey. So, wow. you know, birds have the ability to have a crawl that expands. The nuts were not that large. And again, this was the problem. The reason why, keep in mind, the reason why they imported European chestnuts and Japanese chestnuts into America as a commercial crop, the nuts are so small, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. It's a great wildlife food, and people certainly ate chestnuts. But in terms of a commercial product, you know, the Japanese nuts were so much larger, easier to, you know, process and cook, uh, as were the European um, nuts as well. Okay. Um, Donald, the fungus, how was it spread by air, insects, animals? How did it 
all of so the quickly. above all of the all above. of the above ouch yeah <laughs> anything um it could get on individual shoes uh there was lots of studies in fact some of the best studies of the spread of the fungus occurred uh by the occurred a few years after the blight and it was this uh, pennsylvania blight commission they they brought all these sort of scientists together in Pennsylvania to try to figure out why the blight was spreading and how to stop it. And some of the best studies are in the, the, the publications by that group. And they looked at birds, insects, uh, wind. Um, you know, this is why I say that probably hurricanes and storms were a big spread of the, of the blight because the spores love moisture and the wind would just sort of take the spores and send them you know, literally um, hundreds of meters, hundreds of yards, you know, in just a matter of minutes. Wow. Um, this is going back to the blights. Are there insect species that were dependent on the American chestnut that also went extinct when the blight struck? Great question. Uh, in my book, I talk about... Um, five moth species that became extinct as a result of the of the blight mm -hmm. and I actually mentioned them by their scientific name actually not their scientific names but by their common name you'll often find these scientific articles that mention their scientific name but i actually translated and found the, the non-scientific I, I can't recall all five of them off the top of my head but they have found since the study was done found one of the moth species still alive, still in existence. So I think there's four moths that became extinct. And when you think about it, four species becoming extinct, that's a lot of species, you know, so that represents quite a, an amazing yeah. extinction. Uh, and the Allegheny wood rat, it's now an endangered species, and they believe it's endangered because of the loss of the American chestnut, because it Wow. It, it literally cached when they find all these ancient sort of, you know, caches of the Allegheny wood rot, wood rat. They find, you know, nut shells and, and all that from the American chestnut. So I think the Allegheny wood rat would certainly benefit more. And of course, um, again, when you look at um, the animals that fed on the American chestnut, black bear, um, you know, squirrels, rough grouse. Uh, you know, white-tailed deer, all of these species declined in number after the chestnut blight. And this is like empirically documented. I talk about this in, in my book at how, you know, literally, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% of, you know, mammal populations uh, declined as a result of the loss of the American chestnut. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, well, here's one last question, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, this is, as an individual who owns a woodlot, are the nuts the most practical way to try to do starts, or would that just be a disaster? Well, I've grown the nuts. Uh, you know, I've put them in the fridge and a little peat and a little sand, and they've always sprouted for me. So it's pretty easy to to grow okay. them from nuts. Um and then, you know, you plant them in little pots and then you can transplant them later. Uh, but it's always easy, easier if you can find saplings and seedlings uh, to plant them first. But uh, they're easier to grow than you might think. You know, they're not that temperamental if you have good soil and, um, you know, they like open sort of terrain. And in the early stages, they, they like it open, lots of sunlight. Um, right. Well, it sounds good. I, I think um, everyone's inspired. Everyone go out and plant a chestnut in your yard. How's that? Great, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donald, for being with us today and sharing um, all Thanks this great information me. about American chestnut. Thanks for having me. Great. And happy Leap Day, everyone. <laughs> yes, happy Leap Day. <laughs> okay. Well, bye -bye. I know. Bye now. Hi, Joan. Hello. Oh, great. I can hear you and I can see you. 
Um, okay. So if you if you want to start sharing your screen, I will introduce you here, Joan. So I am okay. pleased to introduce Joan Maloof. Joan is the author of Nature's Temples, A Natural History of Old Growth Forests, which she revised and expanded in 2023. Today, she will present the special biodiversity of old growth forests. So welcome, Joan. Thank you, Renee. And uh, for those of you that just um, witnessed Don's wonderful presentation, you might wanna <laughs> stretch a little bit. Um, <laughs> so here we are inside on this beautiful early spring day. And um, gonna talk about the special biodiversity of old growth forests. So when you um, are trying to identify an old growth forest in the field, how easy that is depends on where you are. So if you're in California, in the Redwood region, as I am on the left here, it's pretty easy. But if you are in the Eastern US, as the photo on the right, um, you can be in an old growth forest and not be able to tell by the size of the trees. I'm, my arms are around a 350 year old uh, chestnut oak tree here. So our first indicator of an old growth forest is the size of the trees. You'll have some big trees, but of course, how big depends on where you are. But in addition to the large trees, such as we have here on the right in this photograph in Worcester Memorial Park, Ohio, there will be trees of all sizes. So there's medium trees and there's saplings and there's seedlings. So don't be fooled and think that you're gonna walk into an old growth forest and you're gonna see nothing but large trees. Um, many old growth forests are overlooked because they do have many small trees and people think, oh, it can't, can't really be an old growth forest. Now this variation in tree sizes is one of the many reasons that there's a lot of biodiversity in the old growth forest because some organisms need the very large trees that form large cavities. And then some organisms need the leaves and the buds that are on the forest floor near the forest floor with the smaller trees. Now, how to recognize an old growth forest besides the size of the trees, because they're not always large. Well, one way is by the bark of the trees. As a tree ages, the bark changes, and it can be challenging for people trying to identify trees by the bark. So this, um, my hand is on a chestnut oak tree in Fort Hill, Ohio. And that is a fabulous old growth forest if you ever get a chance to visit it, one of my favorites. And you can see how that bark has very deep ridges and that comes with age in the chestnut oak. But in the photo on the left, the shagbark hickory, you don't have those hard ridges. Instead, you have really fibrous plates. And the shagbark hickories, the older they get, the more shaggy they get. So a very young tree won't have the shaggy bark at all, just develops with age. And both of these characteristics of the bark are something that will help with the biodiversity in the forest because they form habitat. So under the shagbark hickory fibrous bark, it's a wonderful place for bats to hide, or even some birds will nest up under that shaggy bark there. And of course, there's all kinds of insects that will live on these trees in this uh, kind of three-dimensional bark. And these insects then can become food for the birds that roam over these barks picking off the insects. So already we have a lot of biodiversity just because of the bark changes. And um, this tree is an American beech. This is in Logwood Gardens, Pennsylvania. And we're used to thinking of the beech trees as being so smooth, 
But this one, you can see as they age, develop a more textured bark at the base. So this is an indicator to me of a very old beech tree, besides the size, of course. And the last slide about uh, bark, just an, another couple examples. So the one with my hand and the um, pink line, that's a loblolly pine, an, an old one. So you can see again how the, um, the bark plates are very thick. In a young pine, you won't have that. Then on the left, we have the opposite thing happens. And this is a tulip poplar tree, Liriodendron tulipifera. And as the tulip poplar trees get older, the bark actually balds, it sheds, it falls off this thicker bark. So when tulip poplar trees get to be over a hundred years old, you'll see this balding that'll happen and it'll start moving up the tree as the tree gets older. Um, white oaks are another tree that does that. And a lot of times people worry about this, but from what I've seen, it's just a very natural occurrence in the older trees and a good way to tell the age of a forest. I think my main indicator these days, you know, all these indicators of old growth forests, we put them all together when we walk into a forest, of course, and we're looking at the size and we're looking at the bark and we're looking at many things, but I tend to be looking up these days and looking at the canopy structure. And the old forests just look kind of weird up there. <laughs> They're nothing like the trees that you would grow and that you would draw in grade school with the nice regular V-shaped branches. They look all odd like this. So the tree on the right was the same exact genetic species, genetic makeup of as the tree on the left, but the tree on the left was grown in an open area and the tree on the right was grown in a forest. So in a forest, the tree does not need those lower branches for the leaves because in fact, those leaves would just be shaded and it wouldn't do the tree any good photosynthesis wise. So instead the forest trees, they're always growing as tall as they can, as fast as they can. And once they get above the canopy, that's when they'll spread their branches out further and um, makes it very easy to tell whether a tree was grown in a forest or in an open pasture um, situation. And then maybe a forest grew up around it. So this is a classic, classic canopy of an old growth tree. When I look up and I see a tree like this, I will estimate that it is over 200 years old. And um, this is a tree, believe it or not, right in Philadelphia, right in Center City. And um, somebody else that could recognize old trees pointed these out to me and we discovered an old growth growth grove in Carpenter Park. Okay, so we have the larger trees, we have the trees with this unusual canopy structure. And by the way, I didn't mention the reason the canopy structure is so odd looking is because those trees have been standing in the same spot for hundreds of years and lots of things have happened. There have been ice storms, there have been wind storms, there have been other trees next to them falling down and knocking out branches. There have been trees that fell down and opened up the canopy to sun. So these trees are always adjusting by the way that they grow and they just about never give up. They grow as long as they're alive. So some of those trees that will die standing and we call them snags. And the snags are very important habitat in forest. And we can see a little bird there on the right, a cavity dwelling bird. And this is a cavity dwelling bird that doesn't have the beak structure to be able to make its own cavity like a woodpecker can. So these cavity dwelling birds depend on naturally occurring snags with holes in them. So 
still standing dead trees with holes. And this is an indicator of old growth forest because if this forest had had a lot of silviculture activity, they likely would have knocked down this tree because it was just in the way of the new growth that they wanted to come in. And just a couple more shots of snags. Uh, the snags on the left, very important also for mammals. Things like flying squirrels will winter over together in spaces like this where they're high above the forest floor and safe from predators. And then on the right, that that was in um, Albright Grove, an old growth forest in Tennessee. And behind my knee there is a deep cavity in this large old tree that would be big enough for a bear. And these are these large cavities in the old growth trees that are large were important for mammals even of that size. Another indicator of an old growth forest is coarse woody debris. So that's basically just um, trees that have fallen down and they're dead on the forest floor. And as an ecologist, <laughs> This is not an unfortunate thing because this is a part of a natural old growth forest. This forest will have um, generations coming up and going down and that's just the way it should be. And in fact, the generations on the forest floor that have died contain more living organisms than the standing living trees. So these um, logs, as they're decomposing, they're a place for fungi to grow, they're a place for moss to grow, they're a place for beetles to live and eat the bark, they're a place for lizards and salamanders to eat the beetles. And there are just many, many things that are surviving on these trees. And in addition to that, they are decomposing, releasing their nutrients down into the soil. And they act like a kind of a sponge to hold moisture on the land. So you can imagine now why as an ecologist, I am kind of happy when I see nice coarse woody debris on the forest floor, because that's the way it should be. And in fact, um, this, Nice large log here is an American chestnut tree in Smoky Mountain National Park of North Carolina because these large trees in the old growth forest can take many, many decades, many decades to decompose. And as they're there on the forest floor, they're providing life for many other life forms. And the way that a tree dies as well um, determines the kind of habitat it provides. So we already talked about the standing dread trees, they form snags and their habitat for things that wanna be up off the forest floor, especially animals. But in the old growth forest, one of the indicators is trees that have just fallen over on their own and their roots have pulled up this soil mound. And on the other side of the roots, if we could walk around the back, we'd see this pit that maybe was collecting water. So these blow, blown over trees or fallen over trees create a pit and mound topography, another indicator of old growth forest. And the pit and mound topography adds to the biodiversity because there are organisms that maybe need this little puddle of water here, especially the amphibians, you know, frogs and salamanders and um, insects can lay their eggs in there. And then there are other organisms that need the mound. They want to be above the leaves of the forest floor. They wanna be above the things that are 
the grazers that are eating things on the forest floor. So pit and mount topography, another indicator important for biodiversity. Another thing I notice when I walk through an old growth forest is that I'll see fewer invasive species. And here's a beautiful display of wildflowers in Worcester Memorial Park, Ohio. And this was taken in April. So pretty soon the Ohio display is gonna start up again. You lucky Ohioans, I love the Ohio forests. And I've kind of leaned this talk today toward Ohio, although I see in the chat that there are people from many places on it. So welcome, <laughs> been to your forest too. Okay, so we know that these older forests are very important for habitat and for the organisms that live in them. But you've probably seen this too. You'll see a tree, a forest that's maybe a hundred years old, a native mixed forest, and it's just cut down. And this one was cut down by the state of Maryland. This was, was cut down by the state of New Jersey. So when I say by the state, meaning they put out a long logging contract for it to be done. And um, it's heartbreaking because in one fell swoop, we're losing most of the biodiversity in that forest. And this one that in the, in the Maryland State Forest, um, they cut it out just to make way for to grow loblolly pines because that's what's worth the most money there. And this one on the right, they cut out these oak trees for that were over 100 years old, many of them, just to create early successional habitat for some of the species that could be hunted, like, um, like the woodcock and the quail. So yeah, you can see that look on my face. Not very happy about that. <laughs> those, um, those animals are important, but we should not be taking out our 100-year-old forest for habitat for them just so they can be shot. And I would also think about when I'd see a forest taken down like that about, well, what about the box turtles? You know, they're just crawling there on the forest floor. They can't run away from that equipment. And box turtle populations are declining. So that seems to never be talked about in those situations. And then I would also think about the um, neotropical migrants. These birds come back to the US every year for nesting and for eating all our wonderful insects that are in the forest. And they have a real fidelity to place. So they will come back to the same forest year after year for their whole life, maybe even the same tree. For 15 years, it's been documented. So what happens when they return on their migration and that forest is just down? What do they do? Well, maybe they'll find another habitat, but then there's going to be a lot of stress there because likely that habitat is already occupied by other birds that have been returning to that same space. So there's a little tension here between um, people like me that love the old growth forests and appreciate the biodiversity that they provide and the beauty. I haven't even talked about that, but you can see that in the photos. And the silver culturalists that are trying to get the maximum income from a forest. And I would also I would often hear it be said, forests much must be managed to be healthy. And I'd see it in print and I'd see it said, and a lot of owners of forests thought, well, maybe that must be true if the foresters are telling them that. But as an ecologist, I question this. And as a scientist, it's just like, really? Must a forest be managed to be healthy? what would it look like if we compared an unmanaged forest, that means an uncut forest, with a forest that was managed for timber products? How do we measure that health? So I decided 
I needed to write a book about this. <laughs> and this is my newest book, Nature's Temples, Natural History of Old Growth Forests. So what I did was I just dove headlong into the scientific literature and any scientist who had compared an unmanaged forest and a managed forest with whatever their study organism was, what did they find out? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. In other words, if you studied birds and you compared old growth forests that were uncut to younger forests, what would you find? And here is what you would find. So basically with birds and forests, so here along this, we can call it the x-axis, is habitat that is recovering from a disturbance and getting older and older and older. So the trees will start coming in in the first 25 years, and then the sun-loving trees will be there, and then the shade-loving trees will come in. And then finally, here we have a 100-year-old forest or 100 years or more. Um, of on its way to being an old growth forest if it's not yet. So what you will find is that different bird species like the different habitats. So some bird species like the very young weedy open forest, but then some other bird species, especially like the warblers, the insect eating birds, the ground nesting birds, they prefer the older forest. So. Um, birds are declining across the spectrum. So we need to keep the full complement of forest ages, including old forests, if we want to keep the full complement of bird species. And some birds have already disappeared along with the disappearance of our old growth forests. Um, one example is red cockaded woodpecker. Now it's not completely gone yet. There's still some, but it's rare. And the reason it is rare is because it needs large living pines with rotting interiors. So this is a, um, as trees get very old and large, often their interiors will rot. And that's part of the cavity we talked about. And that's just a natural occurrence. And the red cockaded woodpecker needs pines like that. And they need living pines because they need pines that are still producing sap. And that sap comes out around the hole and it discourages snakes from going into their rotted interior of the tree where the nests are made. Now the ivory bill woodpecker was another bird that needed large diameter snags for nesting. And passenger pigeon, as Don mentioned, it needed mass producing trees. Those are like the um, chestnuts, like the oaks, like the beech trees, and an open forest floor that's um, part of the habitat, another indicator of the habitat of old growth forest. So we've cut down a lot of most of the old growth forests in our country. I'll show you some maps and the passenger pigeon disappeared at the same time, not to mention being shot and hunted at the same time that all these forests were coming down and these birds were affected by that. Now in my research, as you might imagine, you come across all kinds of different researchers doing all kinds of different work comparing younger managed forests with older forests. And by the way, this is another reason we need old forests so we can do this sort of research. It's very difficult for these people in many cases to get to and find these old forests and their sample sizes are small <laughs> because these forests are so rare. So um, this, this little tiny snail here is about the size of a grain of rice. And this is a snail that has only ever been found in old growth forests. And 
who did this work. This was a master's degree student in Tennessee. And he just said, I wanna study the snail populations of forest depending on the forest age. And just collected tens of thousands of snails of many different species over a hundred species had identified them and determined the snails that were more common in the old growth and some only in the old growth. And the same thing was done by people studying insects. And this caterpillar curve line looper only found in the old growth forest. And there were some ground beetles that are only found in the old growth forest. So that means when we cut these forests, those species will disappear from those forests and may never come back as far as we can tell. Another researcher um, studied these calisioid lichens, which are tiny, tiny, pretty much microscopic little lichens. So if somebody pointed one out to you and said, there, there, you know, look right there, you can see it right there, you might see it kind of like a deer tick, right? <laughs> but otherwise you would just overlook these things. And um, even the researchers, they don't even try to identify them in the field. They just collect from all different places in the forest, on the tree, like in the bark, in the hole of a bark, on a branch bring that back to the lab, identify the species. And what they found was that in a young forest, you'll only have zero, one or two species. In a second growth forest, which is one that's recovering from being cut, you'll have three to 19 species. But in an old growth forest, you'll have over 20 species of these calisioid lichens. So that is biodiversity right there. I think my favorite indicator of the biodiversity in older forests are the salamanders. And these numbers here are from a study of redback salamanders, which is the most common salamander. And in a clear cut, there were no redback salamanders. And one reason is because they need dampness, they need moisture. And they don't have lungs, they can't breathe through their mouth, they breathe through their skin, so um, some, many of them. So if you cut a forest and everything dries out and the soil is compressed, these salamanders won't be able to live. But in the old growth, there were 488 per acre of the redback salamanders. Now, another reason salamanders, you'll find many more of them, and diversity of species in the old growth forest is because the big old trees that are growing roots down through the soil, um, just like how some branches will occasionally die, some roots will occasionally die underground. And that forms like a tunnel, a channel that these salamanders can live in. And this is really their habitat. <laughs> and down in those, they're called micro uh, macro pores by the scientists who studied them. Down in the macro pores, the salamanders can stay moist and they can stay hidden from the other animals that would eat them. So if you log a forest, you're compressing those macro pores and you're could be smashing the salamanders, but it, you're at least um, destroying their habitat. And also the salamanders need the seasonal pools of water or the pools of water that will be from a big tip out up mound. And the these pools in the forest, these vernal pools are where they come out once a year to mate and to lay eggs if you're a female or fertilize the eggs if you're a male. So these um, the habitat in the old forest, very important to keep salamander numbers and diversity up. Um, also moss species need older forests. Um, some of the moss species are specialists 
on big old trees. And one of the reasons for that is because of the bark, as I mentioned, how it can get thicker in some species. And that thick bark can hold moisture and that moisture in the bark can keep the moss alive during a dry spell. So a young tree with thin bark won't be able to stay moist for as long and that moss won't be able to grow. And the um, certain moss species can actually be indicators of an old growth forest. So besides just the structure of the forest, which I started the talk with, there's also the um, species that can be indicators. And there, my, what my research showed me is that there's also more mushroom species in older native forests. And it's interesting how little of this research has been done. Um, most of the information in my, my book came from one PhD thesis and one master's degree thesis. And one of the reasons for the biodiversity of mushroom species in the old growth is you'll have um, a lot more of the dead wood. So the saprophytic fungi can grow. And then of course there's the um, mycorrhizal fungi that are sharing nutrients with the roots of the trees. And those relationships can take many years to establish, you know, to get just the right mushroom growing on just the right tree. <laughs> and um, so the older that tree is, the more likely it is to have multiple uh, mycorrhizal connections with fungi. And so those mushrooms that you see popping up on the forest floor, some of them actually are connected to tree roots. Others are just growing on the dead wood and others are growing on the soil substrate. Okay, um, biodiversity. So what did the researchers find out about wildflowers or we could call them herbs or just um, plants? What they found was that there's more plant diversity and plant cover in the unlogged forests. And in fact, they have never seen a forest completely recover its plant diversity from being logged. And that's not to say it won't if we give it another 100 or 200 years or so, but it has not been established yet. Now, this might seem kind of counterintuitive because you know that the wildflowers like sunlight and in a dense old growth forest, you think of it as being shady and why would that be good for these plants? But in fact, another indicator of old growth forests that we didn't talk about is gaps. And that is where you'll have one of these big old trees. It's really dominated the canopy and it reaches the end of its life or it gets knocked over in a storm and it falls over. And because that canopy was so large, what it leaves behind is this big empty space, this gap <laughs> in the forest that allows sunlight to come into the forest floor. And that's very important for biodiversity in a forest. Often too, those trees will come over and they'll knock a couple other trees with them and so that gap gets even larger. So sunlight is important for the, the wild flowers, the herbs, but through these gaps that are formed naturally and leaving the forest soil intact. So the uh, wild flowers that we think of, the ones that are gonna be come blooming very soon, if they haven't started already in some sunny spots <laughs> to the south are things like the trillium and the bloodroot and the crittalis and the spring beauty and the Dutchman's breeches and the violets. Now these woodland wildflowers produce seeds that are interesting, they don't last very long. So the seeds can dry out and decompose, but these seeds 
have this special structure on them called an eliosome. And the eliosome is highly nutritious for insects like ants. And as far as we've been able to tell, the only reason that these plants have evolved seeds with the eliosomes on them is to attract ants that will then carry the seeds back to their nest where they'll eat the eliosomes or feed the eliosomes to other members of the colony and then kick the seed out because they're done with it and the seed's intact and it can germinate. So in fact, these ants are working as dispersers and you, so they'll spread through a forest, but just very slowly. <clears throat> And we don't realize that many wildflowers are long-lived perennials. So the, um, the wildflower here has an average lifespan of 64 years. My PhD um, mentor studied a patch of these plants and he found that um, it takes four years for them to get big enough to flower. And then they can go another 40 years of occasional flowering and then possibly go dormant underground for 24 years. So this was a long-term data set where he followed these flowers. Oh, we already talked about that. Okay, so drum roll. My book <laughs> goes on to describe all these things, the comparing the older unmanaged forest to the younger managed forest. And we didn't even talk about carbon storage. That's a whole talk in itself. But the older unmanaged forest store much more carbon, not only in all that big wood and the coarse woody debris, but also in the soil. These older forests have more salamanders, more lichens, more beetles, more fungi, more snails, and more wildflowers. So I ask you, which forest is the healthier? I would say it's the uncut, unmanaged forest. And why this is important is because we are losing biodiversity. And in my mind, um, this is equal to the climate crisis. So we all need to be doing our part to protect forests because they are home to 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. And the older the forest, the more biodiversity. And this map shows where the old growth forest, or we can call them original forests or primary forest where they were and where they aren't anymore. So if you look at the yellow and the green all together, that's the forested parts of our globe. And at one time, all of these forests or the majority of the forest, except where there was a natural disturbance, such as a windstorm or a wildfire, intense wildfire, this would, these would have all been old growth forests. But with the cutting of the forest, we've reduced that to now the original old growth forests are in the green areas. So a lot of the boreal areas and still down in the tropical areas. And these maps were done focusing in on the US, um, the area of, they called it virgin forest then in 1620. So at you know European colonization, the black areas, the forested parts of the country. And by 1850, we had been started chipping away at those forests, using them for the new nation building for all the things that Don said, you know, the, the train trestles and the furniture and the houses, and also exporting these to other countries that had already cut their forests. And you can see the Western forests were still pretty intact at that point, but by 1920, we were actively cutting the Western forests as well. So when we think of the redwoods, we think, oh, they saved the redwoods. Well, we saved 5% of the redwoods, 95% has been cut. So since 1920, a lot of this um, forest has been cut 
to the point where now the best estimates are that there's 5% left of the original old growth in the West and 1% in the East. Now that can be discouraging. <laughs> and here's what that looked like in Ohio. Um, the Ohio forest cover in 1600 was 95% forested. And these colors just represent different um, forest types, you know? So there's a little bit of grassland up here, um, but a lot of beech forest, a lot of white pine maple swamps, a lot of oak and sugar maple, um, mixed oak forests. But this moving map on the right, um, this is the low forest cover in 1940, only 15%. So we went from 95% to 15%. But the good news is Ohio forest cover has been increasing as farms were abandoned and the forest naturally grew back. And this happened in a lot of places in the Eastern US. I'm just using the Ohio example. So what can we do? These forests that have grown back, we need to save some of them. We need more than 1% old growth because of the biodiversity. And so because of that, I decided to start an organization um, where we would work together to protect at least one forest in each county from being logged again and make sure it's open to the public so people can see and enjoy what these forests look like. And we want these to be accessible for us all across the country. So the one in each county, these colors again are forest types, not everywhere is forested in the US. So that's our estimate that approximately 2,370 counties can support forest growth. So that's our goal in creating the old growth forest network. So we work to save any old growth that's left but we also work to make sure that we're, we have future old growth forests and people can see these places. It's a big job, right? So how we do this is we get a volunteer in each county, we call them a county coordinator, and we have them look for a forest that, well, if there's old growth, that's great, but if there's not as mature as possible. This forest needs to be protected from logging, open to the public and relatively accessible to become part of the old growth forest network. And sometimes a forest has all these things to begin with, somebody save them. And sometimes we need to help with things such as the protection from logging or open to the public. So Ohio, <laughs> you got lots of counties and what does the old growth forest look like in Ohio? Well, I'm super excited to say that Ohio has more forests in the network than any other state in the country. Yay, Ohio. And um, that really surprises people around the country when they hear that because they think Ohio forests and um, they, and I say, yes, I've been to many beautiful forests in Ohio. They're small many times, but lovely. You have some nice old forests. And it's it's funny too, because, because there's more forests in the old growth net, forest network than any other states. Some reporters have picked that up and said, Ohio has more old growth forest than any other state. Well, I'm sure Oregon and Washington don't like to hear that. So it's not really true. You don't have more old growth forests. You just have more of them in the old growth forest network. And part of the reason for that is because people have been helping us. They've been enthused. So what, um, what we ask for when I give talks or you can go on our website is we ask for nominations because we can't know where all the special old forests are. And anybody can nominate a forest. So these ones shown in yellow or ones where there's nominations. And then we also need to get that volunteer county coordinator to help us. So the stripes, the red stripes are the county counties with county coordinators. And then when all of that comes together and we decide on the right forest and we talk to the forest managers, then we hold an induction ceremony 
And then those are the forests in green with forests that already have forests inducted into the old growth forest network. So you're looking at this map, there's some gray areas. We don't have any nominations. We don't have any volunteer county coordinators. I welcome you to go to our website, raise your hand, nominate for us, tell us you wanna be a county coordinator. Thanks, be, and get on our list too. And then when we have our next forest induction ceremony, we'll invite you all. So by now you're probably wondering about um, where these forests are in these counties in Ohio. So you can go to our website, oldgrowthforest.net and click on the forest button and they're organized by state and you can go to wherever state you're from. I know it's not just Ohio people here today um, and see where the forests in the old growth forest network are in your state and they're all open to the public, right? And information's on there for exactly how to get there. And by the way, the state with the second most forest is Pennsylvania. And they they don't like that Ohio's in the lead right now. So they're they're looking for forests right now for us to dedicate into the network. So as of this week, we have 234 forests in the network in 30 different, 36 different states. And um, since we are a 501c3 nonprofit, you see we have our donate button there and our work is entirely supported by um, just private individuals who believe in it and small family foundations. And our um, staff has been slowly growing so that we have representatives um, in regions now. And we also create a lot of educational resources for people um, about different forest topics. So like forests and health or forests and carbon or um, choices in forest management is our newest one. They're all free, help yourself check that out. So wrapping up, we're not just a network of forests. <laughs> We're a network of people who care about forests. So we help each other, we share information, we come to each other's aid if there's a special threat in forest and we stay connected. And this, this is a induction ceremony at Fort Hill, Ohio, that old growth forest that I mentioned. And here's a little group that helped me save a forest in Maryland. And this was a, nice older forest that was going to be cut down. It was a park land, but they were going to cut down the forest to put in more ball fields. And we said, heck no. And we won that battle. And look what I found growing in that forest. Anybody recognize what that is? Sure enough, it's an American chestnut. And if that forest had been cut down for ball fields, that tree would automatically get killed. It's, it's, it's legal to kill American chestnut trees, um, no matter what the size. So if we wanna save the chestnut, if we wanna save the rest of our biodiversity, we have to save these forests from being destroyed. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Feel free to email me or hop on our website and I'll be able to take a few questions. Great, thanks, Joan, it was wonderful. I did put a link to your website in the chat so folks can click through and um, click on the forest tab if they're interested in nominating forests or pursuing anything that you mentioned about that. Um, you do have some questions, so. Let me see what we got going on here. Um, you talked about forest management plans, and there was a question about if there are any current forest management practices to promote old growth forest health. Um, yes, there's a new type of silviculture they're calling old growth forest silviculture. It can be confusing for people because you can't really speed up the development of an old growth forest. But there are certain of those structures like the standing snags and the down coarse woody debris and the tip up mounds that you can create 
artificially. So you can go into, let's say a medium age forest, and you can say, I'm gonna um, create these structures that we'd find in an old growth forest. I'm gonna knock down a tree with a bulldozer. I'm gonna girdle a tree so it will be a standing snag. I'm going to create a gap artificially like there would be in an old growth forest. And um, you might increase the biodiversity that way by doing those things, affecting the structure, but at the same time, you're taking a chance by having that equipment in there that you're damaging other trees that would have lived forever or that you're compressing the soil for those salamanders. So um, I like to just let nature do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're promoting just leave it alone and let yes. nature take its course. Yeah. They sure. call it passive forest management. Okay. Now that, that doesn't mean, you know, if you had a pine plantation, you know, maybe I'd punch a little hole in it, you know, if you knew just uh -huh. what you were doing. But um, to take a nice, healthy, older second growth forest and to go in there and start messing with it, I'm not in favor of that. Okay, okay. Um, so here's an interesting um, look at things. So if there's a wider variety of species um, and more presumably competition for food, doesn't that impact the decline of a number of species for some species or no? No, no. Um, the wider diversity of species is actually better for biodiversity because many of the insects specialize on just certain tree species. Let's just talk about trees for now. So mm -hmm. there are some caterpillars that will only eat oak leaves and some will only eat maple leaves and some will only eat persimmon leaves. And so the more species you have, the more variety of insects you'll have. And then the more, um, we could call it resiliency, I don't know about that word, but the more food there is for the birds and other organisms. And the bird, the trees don't really compete with that themselves, each other that much. Um, I think this is a common misperception that could be learned in forestry schools and then spread from there. But when I go to the old growth forests, and I've been to so many of them, I tend to see large trees of different species almost right next to each other. It's one of my personal indicators. I don't see it in the books, but it's almost like they're helping each other. Um, so I don't think we should look at it as competition really. I think it's more like cooperation. Okay, sounds good. Um, how large of an area of old growth forest is needed to join the network? Well, we don't have a minimum, but our smallest forest right now is 15 acres. And it is a truly old growth forest, a perfect little postcard old growth forest with a parking area and a trail. And it's one that I had to get a bill passed in Maryland late state legislation to make sure it's protected. Wow. <laughs> so it's protected, open to the public, old nice. growth, only 15 acres. You know, that's a decent size, 15 it, acres. It gives you <laughs> I'd be all for that. Gives you an opportunity to imagine what it would be like if it was hundreds of acres large. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you speak a little bit to, um, you know, one of our problems in our forests, um, secondary and, and smaller are invasives. So do invasives, are they a, a struggle in the old growth forest as much as they are everywhere else? Well, that was one of the indicators that um, when I'm in an old growth forest, I tend to see fewer invasive species if I see any at all. And that to me, that's an indicator too. And it's because of all those plants on the forest floor, they've, um, they're, it's like they're not giving space for the invasives to come in. They've already occupied all the niche space, we call it in ecology. But if you get in there and with heavy equipment and you're cutting and you're exposing the soil, then it's easier for the invasives to get a foothold in there. And also sometimes the equipment 
brings the invasive species in. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. they're more of a problem in forests that have been cut than in the old growth forests that are left. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of questions, Joan, related to um, fire management, preventing wildfires. Um, how, how is that done or is it done in these old growth forests? Well, this is a huge topic right now. And so my book, Nature's Temples, is an update from an earlier version of Nature's Temples in, that came out in 2016. And when I added chapters, I added a chapter on fire because I get this question a lot. So I did a lot of research on it, although I'm not an expert. I just read a lot of papers and books. And what I've come to accept is that we really don't understand the fires that well. And partly is because it's so difficult to do studies around, especially the high intensity forests. Um, the, so it's very controversial. You'll have some people saying that thinning out the forest will help and, and doing prescribed burns will help stop the wildfires. And other research shows that no, that dries the forest out and it lets wind carry through easier. And so you'll have higher intensity forests in these thin and burned forests. Um, I would recommend if somebody's really interested in this to read a book called Smoke Screen by Chad Hansen. And he's done a lot of research on this topic. And what he's saying, well, the research in his book is showing is that it looks like the older forests actually have somewhat a preventative effect on the spread of the intense wildfires. And it's because they hold more moisture, they're shadier, they have more coarse woody debris holding moisture, so they're damper places, and they have more layers in the canopy that slows the wind down. So fires are less likely to spread quickly and be intense. But the exception saying that there can be intense fires in old growth forests. And um, when that happens, that creates a very special type of habitat that also has its own biodiversity. So you have these large old trees with these blackened boles now, and there are insects that will come from dozens of miles away. They can smell the smoke and they're there like the trees are still warm and they're on those trees. And then you'll have birds like the blackback woodpecker that know that these insects are going to be there and follow them. So these burned old growth forests, we want to recognize them as important habitat too, and not just go in and try to salvage. So it's complex. Yeah, obviously. Well, thanks for the book recommendation. I'll <laughs> share that out after the talk too, so more folks can look into it. Um, we Talking about the downed trees that lay on the forest floor and all the lovely things that come and live in those, do you know if there's any species of tree that supports more life after their death than another species? Mm, I don't, but okay. I don't think that research has been done. Although in Oregon at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, they're doing a study called called the log decomposition study. And it's, they cut down trees of all these different species, big old trees are laying down and now they're studying how they decompose. And the study is supposed to take 200 years, the log decomposition study. So at the end of that, we'll know the answer. <laughs> at well, least for the West. They trees. started, I'm glad they got that yeah. started. So. <laughs> That's maybe, maybe 15 years old, at least by now, or maybe 20, that study. Okay. <laughs> Well, that, I mean, it's at least there. it's a start. Yeah. <laughs> and just the last thing I'm going to ask you about is when you were talking about the amphibian, um, the diversity and the numbers, you mentioned there were 488. Is that all the amphibians in the no. forest? No, the red-backed salamanders. The red-backed wow. salamanders. And that was... Um, Amazing. In that study, it's quite an older study by now, that scientists said he figured somehow that there was actually more biomass of salamanders than there were of mammals 
in that forest. So they're very important, even though we Where don't we usually see them because they come out at night or when it rains. Remind me what state that forest was in. I, I didn't remember hearing. I I have the reference in my book. That's okay. I, that's I okay. Okay. That's fine, Joan. That's it amazing. Was East, it was in the Eastern U.S. It was in the Eastern okay. US. Unbelievable. Well, Joan, thank you so much for um, presenting for us today. Both talks were were just wonderful. Um, and I want to remind everyone that we are going to be back here on Thursday, March 14th with another afternoon of talks related to Native Plant Connections. We'll welcome Angela Morehouse, author of Flower Bugs, A Guide to Flower Associated True Bugs of the Midwest and Trevor Smith for his program, Native Plants, Your Backyard and Climate Change. So register for this session. I will be sending a link out in my follow-up email to everyone who was registered today. So thank you so much, Joan. Thanks, Renee. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Go hiking. <laughs> yes, everyone in the chat was saying they want to go outside and go hiking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>